Hello and welcome to another episode of Socially Distant Discover Nature. I think we are possibly episode 12 now, so we've had 12 weeks of this, minus my week off, which is certainly a thing that has happened. I think we can all agree on that. Now today's episode is about dragonflies and damselflies. It will serve as a brief introduction. By brief, I probably mean 32 minutes upwards. But before we do that, we'll get to our usual catch-up. Now, first of all, we've had Glenn sent in this video of a bumblebee, and it falls on from last week's episode when we were talking about flowers good for pollinators. We mentioned Cotoniaster, a shrub, also known as the bee bush, and here we've got a tree bumblebee foraging on a Cotoniaster. You can tell it's a tree bumblebee because it's got the gingery brown thorax, the black abdomen, and the white tip to that abdomen. Also, Glenn was pootling around in his garden and he uncovered a frog, which is an excellent find. My hay fever is bad, so I need to sneeze. No. <clears throat> it's the worst time to have hay fever, because uh, everyone thinks you've got coronavirus. Perhaps it was a mistake to fill the studio with flowers. <sighs> Never mind. Anyway, quick sip of Robinson's and we're moving on. Just to keep my handy list to hand, we've had Hannah. She sent in several pictures of, of wildflowers. They've got a montage here of a collection of flowers. I can see Bistort, which is that pale bottle brush one. There's also the purpley plant, some sort of geranium, possibly meadow cranes, Bill. What else? Oh yes, Red Campion, which was mentioned in last week's video. Really good source of nectar very long flowering period. And then finally, butterflies. After all this rain and quite bad weather, it's nice to get some sunshine and see some butterflies. And here we've got a speckled wood butterfly, kind of cream, light colored spots on a, a brown background. Very much on theme with today's episode, we've had Ivana send us in these amazing pictures of uh, handling a dragonfly. And this is a Southern Hawker dragonfly, as far as I can tell. A key ID feature is the big kind of yellow shoulder pads. It's quite a big chunky dragonfly. But we'll explore more about dragonflies later. I've also had some interesting developments in the garden. We've got a, a new flower for you. Uh, geranium, it's not a wildflower, it's a cultivated type. But it's very easy to grow, because it grows everywhere. Perhaps too much of everywhere but it is beloved by bees, um, particularly in my garden, red-tailed bumblebees. We've also had quite a few acrobatic shenanigans on the bird feeders. The first one, grainy phone footage, is of an actual bird. This is a, a wood pigeon, and just watch what it does. It's kind of hanging upside down like a cartoon bat, blood rushing to its little bird brain while it's scoffing down, or scoffing up, in this case, the food. Second creature, we had to do something similar, but it's not a bird, it is a grey squirrel. And the most interesting thing about this is it appears to be a nursing female. You can see the fur on kind of the stomach, on the chest, the sort of tummy area. It's completely bare, it's all kind of bright pink skin with huge nipples. Several pairs, at least two pairs, maybe six pairs. Really should have checked that, but I don't really want to be googling squirrel nipples. Um, yeah, because then I'd have to delete my search history. But it was very interesting to see this, and I reckon potentially there are two squirrels, because there was one following the other, so maybe it's a mated pair, or it's still recovering from rearing uh, the baby squirrel. <laughs> Speaking of babies, I've started to see baby birds in the garden. There is still no sign of Beaky's babies, Beaky is becoming uh, quite insistent, quite quite demanding presence. I've got to the stage where he can now see me in the kitchen. He will sit on this roof, peer in, looking at me. If I come out, um, he will fly up instantly. And one time I was just sort of poodling around and he came and alarm called at me. No predators around. He just came up and screamed at me until I got him some raisins. So yeah, we'll have to practice some parental 
control here and techniques, he's also getting a bit a bit too uh, life of luxury for a bird. He likes to be kind of hand fed, not sort of fed in the hand, but have the raisins thrown to him. I was out in the garden one time and I put a little pile of raisins on the green bin, on the top of the green bin back here. Didn't see them, didn't notice them, just came up to me, obviously, because I'm a human who provides food. So I had to go walk across the garden, get the raisins, and then throw them to him so he could see where they were. Now, yeah, perhaps we're developing quite an unhealthy relationship. I don't know, but it's happening. I think, uh, how did I say Baby birds, yes. Just uh, an excuse to play, play some baby bird footage. Maybe we'll have a whole episode on baby birds at one point, but at the moment there's a little bit of baby blue tip footage. Ah, the sweet taste of Robinson's soothes my itchy hay fever throat. In a Boddington's glass. Oh no, there's a bug in it! Ever since I planted these tomatoes, the house is full of little flies. And I cannot have a meal or a drink without at least... Oh, oh god, there's loads! At least, apparently, three of them committing suicide in my beverage or meal. Oh, these tomatoes really taste good. That's all I can say. Right, so on with the main bulk of the episode, which is dragonflies and damselflies. Now, what are they? Well, first of all, they are insects. They've got the exoskeleton, the soft in parts, the jointed limbs, appendages, and they undergo some sort of metamorphosis. Undergo some sort of metamorphosis at some point in their life. They're also part of the family within insects. They're part of the family. Odonata, which contains both dragonflies and damselflies. What is the difference between a dragonfly and a damselfly? Well, in order to explore that, we'll have a look at their life cycle and see how they differ at each part of it. Now, it's very easy, straight away, life cycle. We have props today, very simple props. Start off as an egg, an egg that is laid in a pond different types of eggs actually. The kind of spherical eggs are ones that are just kind of dropped in the water and left to uh, sink or float or fend for themselves. But there are damselflies and I think it's hawker. Let me just check. Don't want to tell you any duff information. Yeah, damselflies and hawker dragonflies like the one Ivana had. Big dragonflies. What they will do is make a slit in some submerged vegetation and they will lay an egg within that and those are more cylindrical shaped. So that's called endophytically laying eggs. So endo in, phytic, phytic. It's referring to plants, so endophytic eggs, laying an egg in a plant stem. But regardless of whether they're in a plant stem or in the water, they are within the water area, pond, stream, maybe not stream, lakes. They're, they're Aquatic, shall we say. What happens next, you might ask? Well, these eggs will hatch out into what we'll normally call a baby dragonfly or baby damselfly. Now, these are known as nymphs. Now, you might have heard of baby insects referred to as larvae or referred to as nymphs. What's the difference? Some people use the term interchangeably, but the Collins Insect Guide, which is kind of like my Bible gospel of insects, says that uh, a larvae are baby insects that look completely different from the adult form. So they undergo what's called a full metamorphosis. Your classic example is the squidgy caterpillar turning into the butterfly. Looks completely different. I'm covered in tomato pollen, never mind. So a nymph is a baby juvenile insect that undergoes what's called incomplete metamorphosis. And it looks to a degree like a miniature adult. So these are the things like the dragonfly nymphs that kind of look like a dragonfly with no wings. So they look very similar structurally to the adult form. 
So technically that's what a nymph are, these are nymphs, they're like slightly mini adults. And I've brought along my model of Natasha the Nymph. This is a dragonfly nymph model made, as all props are, out of a fairy liquid bottle hidden in there. Most noticeable, uh, it's a big squat creature, quite bulky looking, think Dragons of Legend, bulky looking, it looks like it's uh, kind of a mean, lean, well not lean, just a mean hunting machine. Looks like it could do damage. And indeed these things are top predators. So, well, the adult, you've got six legs, or you should do, unless any of the, the cardboard has fallen off. Big chunky body, slightly diamond shaped head. Key thing to look out for that makes them the top predator is this hinged jaw, which is deployable almost like a harpoon with these little claws on the end. Um, nope, it's right here. So, imagine the jaw. I'm a dragonfly nymph. I've got this thing, it's called a mask, folded underneath my head, waiting for a fish to swim past. Tasty little small fish, like a, I don't know what small fish are in ponds, I don't do fish. And then it just poof, fires like this and kind of impales the prey, the little pincers latching on, drawing it back into the mandibles where it eats them. This is an impressive piece of kit and it is believed to have inspired the jaw parts of the alien from the film Alien. <sighs> Insert your own alien jokes. Yeah, so this is what a uh, <clears throat> dragonfly nymph looks like. It's not life-size. Biggest ones get about that big. I've probably got some footage that I can show you. The damselfly ones, they got a much longer, thinner body. They have the diamond-shaped head, but one of the key differences to look out for is these three things sticking out the back. Things three fins almost that they look like. They're not, they're actually gills. So I think the technical term is caudal lamellae. So they're like feathers, three feathers sticking out of the back. The dragonfly nymph doesn't have those feathers sticking out the back, those gills. The gills are internal in this. So this provides an interesting mechanism because in order to get the water across the gills and extract the oxygen, they have to pump water in through their rear end across those internal gills. It also means they can pump water out of their rear end and they can do it quite quickly in emergencies to jet propel themselves across the pond away from predators. Damselfly nymphs, because they've got those external gills, they can't do this. So the only way they can evade predators is by swimming as swiftly and as uh, quickly as they can away from predators. I don't want to put it down actually. Yeah, so these things will stay in the pond for one to three years, maybe longer in some of the bigger dragonfly species, going through stages, sort of growing, shedding skin, growing, shedding skin, and eventually they will be ready to emerge. So they will find a plant stem, crawl up the plant stem, and this is where the magic begins. The adult dragonfly has been growing and developing, and these structures on the back, which you could probably see better in the real thing, are the wing buds, where the wings are developing. And once they've climbed up that plant stem, they will start to emerge. So this involves kind of them chewing the way out of their final skin. So they'll chew the way out just kind of behind the head. They've shed this final skin and within is the adult dragonfly waiting to emerge. So it bites its way out, it heaves its soft body out of this tiny hole and it will pump its body up full of fluid. It will pump fluid into the wings which will gradually unfurl at like the sail of a ship. At this stage, it's extremely vulnerable to predators, extremely vulnerable to damage. So if the wings get bent at this stage, then they will set hard in that kind of warped position. So they won't be able to fly that well. So very vulnerable at this stage, but if all goes well, the adult dragonfly will sit on top of the shed skin and just rest. 
changing its colour slightly as it dries, hardening up. Once it's ready, it will fly away. Now they do leave behind a perfect shed skin of the nymphal stage. And you can find these clinging still to plant stems. There's one here. You're not going to be able to see that, so I might have to get a macro lens on it. Very small. It's, well, it's an absolute perfect cast of it. You can see the wing buds, you can see its eyes, you can see the mask hinged jaw, and you can see the hole just behind the head where the adults climbed out. Incredible. And once you get to the adult stage, the difference between dragonflies and damselflies is even more marked. So, what I have done is brought along Derek, the demonstration dragonfly. Derek has been with me for 10 years now. Derek first appeared in a St. Nick's workshop, um, made his, his maiden voyage, and has been with me ever since. He's been upgraded with tape and repairs, but he's still kind of the same Derek the Dragonfly. It's actually a life-size replica of one that existed, ooh gosh, I think it's about 300 million years ago. Maybe I'll put the text up on screen to tell you exactly how many, if I've got it wrong. But back in the day, that day 300 million years ago, there was a lot more oxygen in the atmosphere. Now insects largely breathe through um, diffusion, they don't really have a, a lung system in the sense that humans do to pump air around the body. The air diffuses, goes in through little holes along them and kind of travels short distances within them. And the higher the concentration of oxygen, the further it can diffuse to an area where there's no oxygen. So back in the day, 300 million years ago, insects could be a lot bigger. They could be this big because there's more oxygen, it can diffuse further along so you can have a bigger insect structure. The reason I brought Derek the dragonfly along is to highlight key differences between dragonflies and damselflies. So the first one, dragonflies have massive pair of eyes which take up most of the head and they often meet in the middle, but the head is consisting mostly of this giant pair of eyes. Dragonflies can look a lot bulkier than damselflies, but it's, it's kind of subjective. But the other thing is the wing resting position. So dragonflies almost exclusively will rest when they come to land with their wings held out and open to the sides, like, like that. And dragonfly, the sort of scientific name for dragonflies is anisoptera, which means different wings. So I don't know if you can see in Derek, but he has the fore wings are different shape to the back wings. The fore wings are narrower, and that's another key difference. But the main thing, the most obvious thing you will see is when the dragonfly comes to rest, it will hold its wings out to the side like that. Now I don't have a Dave the damselfly model, unfortunately, but the differences with the damselfly are First of all, the head. The compound eyes aren't as massive and they appear on the side of a head that looks a bit like a hammerhead shark. So if you imagine long thin damselfly body and then it forms a kind of T shape with the head on it with the eyes on either side. I'll flash up some pictures and footage so you can see. So hammerhead damselflies. Very long thin body. They look quite insubstantial especially when they're, they're flying, but when they are perched, they hold their wings usually closed behind them, like that. In fact, I do have some uh, damselfly wings here, so they will fold them together behind them, like that. Some, there's one species, can't remember which one is top of the head, might hold it out at 45 degrees, but generally wings are closed. And if you have a really good look at them, well, you can see there are Two wings here, they're exactly the same size, and the Latin name for damselflies is Zygoptera, which means same wings, or same size wings. One of those things. Essentially, the wings are the same size. And those are the main differences between dragonflies and damselflies. 
through the different stages of their, their life cycle. And now I'm going to just take you through a, a few common examples that you might see out and about. Now the first one, get my piece of paper, is the blue-tailed damselfly. This was the one actually that I think Jack sent in last week when we saw the juvenile juvenile specimen which was more green rather than blue because if you remember after they've emerged soft bodied from their old nymphal skin they, they start to get their colours but they don't get the final colours until after a while so it takes some time I think there's a bird or a velociraptor on the roof shouldn't worry about it yes yeah, so the blue blue tailed damsel flies you can quite easily identify these because Regardless of the rest of the markings, usually the long, thin abdomen is mostly dark, kind of black colour with a, a blue kind of tip or a blue segment on the end. I think I was slightly blessed because today is... Oh, I never know the day in, in lockdown. Today apparently is Sunday. Yesterday was Saturday. On Saturday afternoon I was in the garden and then this damsel flight appeared and was just perched on a, a grass stem. I got some photographs, here they are now. Extremely rare that I've ever seen damselfly dragonflies in, in this garden. It, uh, extremely rare. Maybe it's only happened once, possibly twice before. And just from the colours of this, it all, again it looks like Jack's one. It looks like it's only just emerged. The colours are still kind of turquoisey green. Could it have come from my pond? Surely not. I mean, I'm very proud of the mini meadow. I'm very proud of the flower beds. Even the veg patch is working and this weird tomato plant thing going on here uh, that makes me sneeze. That's quite well. The pond, I was under the impression it's an absolute failure. So I cannot comprehend a world in which that damselflight emerged from the pond. But what if? Who knows? Who knows? Moving swiftly on, away from this. So another species to look out for is the banded demoiselle. So this is an incredible damselfly. The females are a kind of emerald green colour and the males look even more impressive. They're a sort of metallic blue, bluey, greeny, turquoise, but it's the wings. They've got this metallic shimmering dark patch on their wings. There's quite a lot around York. Along the River Ouse I've seen them, Pockland Canal I've seen them, even in the pond at St Nick's. They're like a flying piece of jewellery. I, I urge you to look out for them and they often even don't look like a, a damselfly when they're flying because the dark patch makes them bigger and makes them look chunkier so it's almost like a weird butterfly. So if you're seeing a weird butterfly thing hanging around water, give it a closer look because it could be the banded damsel, and also there's a beautiful damsel which I've never seen, but you should definitely Google that. So those are a couple of damselfly species to look out for. So remember, damselflies, Zygoptera, same wing. Now some dragonfly species to look out for. So biggie one. Is that even uh, in English? Is that that's not really speaking properly? A big species to look out for, big and obvious, is the southern hawker. This is the one that oh dear, southern hawker is the one that Ivana found. See if I can find it in my book. Yeah, southern hawker. Key features to look out for are those bright kind of yellowy green shoulder pads, but also, which I uh, will attempt to zone zoom in on it. There's a according to the book, a prominent triangle on segment two, which is there. So kind of, you're looking at the dragonfly, you've got the head at the top, there's the thorax with the wings attached, and kind of in the next segment area, there is a, almost like an isosceles triangle upside down, which is kind of a yellowy green. It's a big one. I see it everywhere, despite the fact it's called a southern hawker. I'm sure we're officially classed as being up north, here. Yeah, one to look out for. And the final one is quite a common one. It's so common it has the word common in its name, and in this case it does mean common, unlike other things like 
I don't know, I think a common goal is not that common. Anyway, forget that. So a common darter dragonfly. So these are more smaller ones, kind of about the length of uh, my finger. Common darter, if you're seeing kind of bright red ones, they're the males. If there's a more kind of subtle, oh, I don't know how to describe it, maybe olive greenish, slightly brown or tan color, those are the females. We have them at St. Nick's and many, many other places. So these are all great ones to look out for. Speaking of books, I've fanboyed over Richard Lewington before, but this is uh, Field Guides Dragonflies and Damselflies, Great Britain and Ireland, illustrated by Richard Lewington, which means you should acquire a copy. It's also by Steve Brooks, should give him credit as well. But just, just the pictures, they're so, they're just so good and they make identifying so easy. Apart from the ones that I couldn't identify and had to put on iSpot. That brings us to the end of the segment on dragonflies and damselflies. If you have seen any out and about, do send us some pictures. And before we move on to art corner and conclusions, inevitably, because I haven't managed to acquire sufficient legal counsel to get rid of him, we come to another segment from Genghis Mirazapan, the world's, I'm obliged to read this, best wildlife roving reporter. Let's see what he's found, and I'm sure I can deal with it because I have a stress ball, so it will keep me grounded. Genghis, me old pal, me old hearty. What have you found? Yes, hello, Phil. Genghis Marazapan here, while I'm a roving reporter. And if you remember, I, some weeks ago now, I showed you a swan. Now those swans, I've had little baby swans, which are called signals. So if I can catch up with them, we'll be able to see a signal really close. And they're very friendly. See how friendly they are. Ooh, very friendly. Or perhaps not so friendly. Backing away. Back to you. I think I'm going to need more stress balls. Anyway, enough bitterness, on to Art Corner, and Judith is back with an amazing picture she painted of a hare. Lovely. Really captures its essence. I, I'm slightly speechless because I'm just, yeah, it's really good, and it makes me really want to see a hare again. I haven't seen a hare for ages. Thank you very much for watching the latest episode, as always. I'm eager to see your contributions, if you have any to make, photos, artwork, uh, punk rock songs about nature, it's quite niche but it did happen, send them in, discover nature people, you know where to send them to, everyone else, you can find us on Twitter, or it's egosapienshow at gmail.com. Next week's episode, we're going to go into the disaster that is my pond, I'm going to show you how to make a pond, or rather how not to make a pond. And just out of pure curiosity, we will do some pond dipping in the dead zone that is my pond and see if it really truly is a disaster and whether or not I'm going to pond jail. Until next time, goodbye. Well, 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 it looks like Genghis has another segment to give us, and apparently it links into water life. So, you know what? Genghis, I'm ready for you. I've got all the stress balls in the world. Yes, hello, Phil. Can't shout too loudly. Genghis Marazapan here, wildlife roving reporter. Something very exciting. Down here, there it goes, there it goes. It's the return of a pterodactyl to this country. Ah, oh, just missed it. But I think you caught a glimpse of the first pterodactyl spotted in 
A few hundred years, I think. Back to you. Time for a refund, I think. <laughs>